The national team is stronger than Juventus, remember. A fan had written to Craig Brown at the beginning of May with one simple question. Why do you not pick Richard Gold for Scotland? Incredibly, he got a response, signed by the Scotland manager himself on SFA-headed paper. Brown had compared the Champions League hammering with Scotland's two games against Italy, in which Goff didn't play during the qualifying campaign for the World Cup in 1994. Rangers had lost eight goals, while Scotland had conceded just three. Rangers had lost to Ike Athens, while Scotland had beaten Greece twice in qualification for the European Championships, which were now imminent. Goff, Brown said, played 35 times while Andy Roxburgh and myself were with the national team, and we won just 11 of those games. Without him, we've played 18 games, and we've still been able to win 11 of them. Football, from the man who prepared his team for the opposition based on tip-offs from a taxi driver, was a simple matter of deduction. The style of the school teacher reigned supreme. To discuss Richard Goff, Scotland, and an incredibly exciting and entertaining denouement to the season 95-96. I'm joined by Andy McGowan. How are we doing, Andy? Doing great. Getting to the business centre here. I'm standing at light now. Oh, it's, been, it's been a good one it's been a good one and from Athens John Cowden good evening John good evening to you both this hopefully is one of the better episodes shall we say lots to get through as always in this season but but yeah there's uh, plenty of action to, to enjoy can we just talk about Scotland first because it's something that we've touched upon briefly but never really delved into but I think probably now's the time um, to do that we've got Euro 96 on the horizon I'm picking this episode up March um, 1996 Richard Goff is in the best form he's been in for years and he will not get a game because of what he wrote about Andy Roxburgh in his book a couple of years before that. Um, Scotland had two Collins, Henry and Calderwood, and they were steady, reliable options, but I think to dismiss the experience uh, and form of golf, I don't think Scotland were in a position to do that quite entirely. And then you've got other positions, Tosh McKinley and Tom Boyd have had a good season for Celtic, but not as good as David Robertson has been. I think that would be incredible to suggest otherwise, but Robertson can't really get a look in. He makes a decision himself by saying, you know what, if I'm not going to play, don't worry about it. And then Brown's ridiculous handling of Andy Gorham and Jim Layton. Still didn't know who was going to be number one at this tournament. Uh, and Brown said, no one will know until an hour and a half before the kickoff of our first game in England at Villa Park. Um, that's when the decision would be made public. To decide between two of the best keepers in Europe is not easy. You really are looking at a high level of excellence here. I only wish we had the same kind of competition in all the other areas of the team. Uh, the final line there, as inspirational as ever. Um, in truth, it was nowhere near as close. It must have just been loyalty that Brown felt to, to Leighton um, because Gorham was back to his brilliant best. 47 games played that season. Um, I'd this to the handling of Duncan Ferguson and the whole litany of issues with Sunnis, basically uh, with the Sunnis arrival um, with Rangers um, at loggerheads, Andy, with the SFA. Um, this tension was 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 really increasing and increasing and increasing. Rangers, the only Rangers players that could probably be guaranteed a game, a starting place, were the kind of industrial ones, Stuart McCall, Gordon Jury, for example. Um, and maybe... We've got a, a opportunity here where this um, relationship can at least be allowed to break, and maybe Paul Gascoigne is the excuse, or at least a convenient reason for that. Vilified by the fourth estate from his immediate arrival, um, Rangers fans, I think, saw a need to protect him and to be defensive of him. They saw maybe a vulnerability there. Um, Loudrop, and we've got Rangers have got two gods here, really. Loudrop could never be their representative. He's too perfect. There's never a word out of place, never made a pass. Um, but Gascoigne, I think, was was their god. Um, he was them on the pitch, imperfect, rash, vulnerable, uh, and therefore maybe that affinity was, was, was tighter. Um, Jerry McNee is leading the line, really, of the, the press pack. Uh, this is from March the 3rd in the Sunday Mail. The Gascoigne signing remains a gamble, yeah, he wrote. Um and one which could blow up in Rangers' faces, but in fairness to the player, he's scoring vital goals for them. Uh, he says in fairness, as if he was bringing out a point of, of clever nuance that wasn't absolutely obvious to everybody that was following the game every week. Um, you have these 
this tension between the two men, I think, is maybe playing out something greater. And with this Wembley thing, the Scotland England match on the horizon, it's. I don't think any coincidence, Andy, that the Rangers song that we chose to serenade Gascoigne with um, isn't a kind of contemporaneous chart rip off or any other terrace chant really, it's the old Negro spiritual the unofficial anthem of the England rugby team, um, Swing Low Sweet Chariot um, for some Rangers fans it was Albion over Alba that summer Yep, so the disconnect between Rangers support and the Scottish national team obviously took a, a kind of quantum leap in the, the soonest years because of the things you've covered there but at this point you know, Craig Brown was a school teacher, and you're right, we felt very, very protective of Gascoigne, and that kind of changed the dynamic completely because going into, going into 96, Euro 96, you know, I had any, any doubt in my mind that I wanted Scotland to get beat by England and for Gascoigne to actually make them suffer. That was really where I was at because, you know, people at me, the general the general mood music around Gascoigne in Scotland was so negative and uh, pejorative that, you know, we, we want, I wanted him, and I think most Rangers fans wanted him to to do something special. Um, 92, I think, you know, 92, when we had McPherson showing up well, Goff showing up well, we had McCoy, that, that was probably the final time that I ever felt any affinity with the Scotland team in a, in a tournament or at any time, to be quite honest with you. Um I, if you're asking me to support Paul Gascoigne or Scotland, there was no question where I was going to go. I'll be, we can play our cards on the table. I was the same, I was what, 15. Um, and like you, I think 92 was the last, you know, I had the Scotland top and uh, Scotland top in 1990 and. Mexico 86 and, and, and whatever. Um, but that, that's probably the last time I, I felt a kind of connection. Um, I think Gascoigne, as I said, maybe an excuse for it, I don't know, but he became emblematic of, of, of this growing tension that Rangers were just far, far more important. Um, the, the the hatred towards Rangers, I guess, you, as a teenager, when you're starting to um, kind of come of age, you, you start to, to feel, again, protective and, and defensive over that. Um, and I'm just, I'm not sure the two can coexist particularly well, and I don't think it's a Rangers and Scotland thing, by the way. I've spoken to fans of big clubs, basically from you know in England, Manchester United, Liverpool, and and and, and in Europe as well. Uh, and it was a very acute for Manchester United, probably around this time actually getting into the two thousands. Um, they're producing this generation of players for the England team, but so much of English football is anybody but United. And it's like, well, why? How? How can we? we merge with these people who, who obviously hate the club and there was a bit of that with, with Rangers as well and and yeah, um, I just had enough of, of Rangers players just not really getting a look in um, John, I know this goes back a fair bit further for you Yeah, uh, I'm an early adopter I think the last time I supported Scotland in any real shape or form was maybe 78 and after that yeah, uh, they, they were just a joke. I mean, Rangers and Scotland, actually, in the early 80s, were going down a similar path. Mm. Except Scotland embraced it and turned it into we're losers and we're proud of it. And Rangers didn't like losing and eventually turned it around. But the treatment all the way through, even going back to Derek Johnson in the 78 World Cup, um, it just it never grated and... I think there was a time in that 80s where there was fewer and fewer Rangers fans going to the games and it became a lot more anti-Rangers, you know, Scottish in that anti-Rangers way. And yet when you're watching, say, Northern Ireland and England through this thing and then you Terry Butcher, you know, you do see not just the team, but the fans have a kind of similar philosophy in terms of we're here to win it, even if we're rubbish, we still expect to take home the trophy and we're furious if we don't. So that kind of resonated. And then when the Jordan Hill Mafia took over, you know, Roxburgh and Brown and all of that, you just, there was no passion. And I was praying at this point that he actually would pick Leighton over Gorham. I, I mean, I, I didn't want any Rangers player in the team because I wanted them to get absolutely slaughtered because... 
I don't want to see a Rangers player play badly. I don't want to see them be humiliated or slated. So I'm hoping that none of our players get a game. You know, and, that, and on the other side, when McCoy scores that goal against Switzerland, I'm I'm quite happy for for McCoy, not necessarily for Scotland, but I'm shouting abuse at Brown in the inter as I'm watching the, the England Netherlands game, saying, "See what happens if you'd actually pick the best players." Mm-hmm. I, I just I, I don't have any emotional attachment, and I feel sorry for people maybe of my generation, older generation, younger generation who want to be Rangers in Scotland. I include my father, and there's one or two other podders around, and I get where they are, but I just can't bring myself even now to even get warmed up or really be in any way interested in them at all. So. Yeah, not, not quite, quite most balanced point. point. No, it's, it's probably not, but it it represents something because at this time you were at Rangers games, you're seeing not loads, but you're seeing some England tops. Gascoigne eight on the back. Um, I don't know if I've shared it on this pod before. Probably have, uh, but but for the, uh, the the home international against England. Um, tickets would come through clubs traditionally. You would the same way you would apply for away tickets. You would apply through the club for Wembley, um, or, or I think at Hamden as well. Just any any of the the, the 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 two the two grounds. And you know Rangers used to get quite a a substantial allocation for that bit of demand for that. Um, and then after Sunas came, that went. That went down significantly, and I think Andy. I don't know if we would spoken about this offline or, or or on one of these pods, but I think you you talked about the bandwidth that Rangers supporters had available to them after nineteen eighty six, and there wasn't room for both. Certainly in a passionate way, certainly in a, a kind of committed way. Um, if you go back to Tynecastle in February eighty seven, a huge and hugely important win on on the road to to that title. Rangers won five two. But you hear the Hearts fans singing Flower of Scotland. Now, I don't believe that was in any way um, a kind of positive reinforcement of, of, of their Scottishness. This was antagonistic. It was it was basically saying, we are, we're a Scottish club, you no longer are, because you have these three Englishmen, plus Sunas who wishes he was English anyway. And it's very different. And you're not us anymore. And I think you've got something changing. I think John's right. There's there's um, a further genesis to this, but clearly, and soon as is constant war footing with the Scottish Football Association, the Scottish League, the the press, and um, the Scottish football and establishment paints Rangers into a an absolutely separate corner. I think, um, and rolling all the way back, I think international football. If you're going to do it properly, if you're going to go, or if you're going to go to the pub even and, and watch it as part of a community and do it properly where you can hug each other, you can go wild at goals and, and whatever, you have to park your club feelings at the door on the way in because it can't work otherwise because you're all together. And we're we're talking about 1996 at the moment where we have a player absolutely vilified. I do say that, that that relationship has, has gotten worse, perhaps over the years, maybe it's turned a corner of, of late with, with younger fans, I don't know um, but it, I guess it's the Lee Griffiths test really, if you're a Scotland <laughs> fan in Hamden that day um, was that 2017? Um, or you're in the pub or, or whatever and he scores those two goals if you're going to do it properly going absolutely nuts and cheering the hero if you're a Rangers fan, you have to part that at the door in order to do that, in order to to share that moment with people who want your club dead, um, to celebrate a player who tie scarves around the goalposts and, and, and whatever else. And it's a huge bit of cognitive dissonance that fans have to go through. And again, I don't think this is what well, isn't purely Rangers in Scotland. It's definitely Manchester United in England. It's definitely Liverpool in England. Uh, and there are clubs throughout Europe uh, as well that they're just too big too big to, 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 to exist, coexist with the national team in a way that, that, that once 
that that was no problem. Does that, that really make any sense? But it's certainly coming to the boil here in 1996, I think. Oh, you're absolutely spot on, man. I, I, I thought the Lee Griffiths test was something else completely different, but I won't go there. The, <laughs> um, the, the, we have got to remember is that we became an, an Anglo club in 1986 when Sunnis came because it was just it just became an extension. The English players, because remember, there was barely an English player in Scotland at that point, and here we are signing Terry Butcher. So it just became an extension of the you know the Union flags because uh, the England support at that point were still running about with Union flags. It wasn't in St George's flag that they had at that point so it, it started there as you see and everything you've said is absolutely bang on we became bigger than anything the Scottish national team could ever serve up including World Cups mm-hmm. and then you've got at the same time the, the kind of rocketing antagonism towards Rangers from every corner of Scottish society uh, and we're kind of we became an enclave to ourselves so I, I, I could not break bread with anybody that is booing Ryan Jack uh, or wanted the club dead as you said so it's just moved to then and it's became embedded you've, you've probably got a point in that has it reversed a wee bit recently has there been a softening in it I don't know I certainly don't feel it and I think there might be for younger ask, a, young, a younger yeah. generation yeah. I think there has been um, for, for me actually it, it got worse wind this on two years in the World Cup warm-up game. Um, Denmark played at Ibrox. Denmark played Scotland at Ibrox, if, if you remember. And Loudrop was getting booed all the way. All, all, and yeah. just about every sand. Stuff like, like that. You know what, you've just, yeah, th- th- this isn't for me. Fascinating thing. I remember speaking to Professor Graham Walker about the, the sectarian issue because there's a, a chapter on, on that in the, in the book. We're just talking about songs being sung and obviously you, the sash, Derry's Walls, all these favourites for years and years and years. But it was only, yeah, maybe the 1980s, 90s, um, where you're getting Rule Britannia, for example. Um, yeah. And and that being, a, 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 I guess, an emblem, because it's it, it's making a point, it's making a bigger point to, to, to the wider Scottish football and public that, that, that you think we are different. Well, well, we'll wear that badge then. And it does a bit of pantomime just, for that. There's a bit of performative nature of it, but you know people are happy to do it. Scotland England game had disappeared as well, and I think that's a factor. So yeah. I think the last game, you know, the end of season game that had became a nineteen eighty nine was the last one. Aye, it became a nuisance, and you know players were tired and so forth. I think that took a wee bit of the reminder to football supporters of the old enemy, as it was, and that certainly contributed to the overall kind of distancing for. I think Celtic as well. You know, they started pointing towards the Irish national team and they had a research. Yeah, so yeah. it was a strange time in terms of the, the dynamics towards the national team. I think that's a, a really fair point. You'll see Celtic tops everywhere at Italian 90, for example, when the Republic are playing same in the World Cup 94. And maybe, kind of taking on from John's point, this is where Scotland is maybe more and more um, or, uh, populated to the Scotland support Tartanami especially um, by a wide range of clubs which means clubs that are not used to winning <laughs> because it's not the old firm they're, they're going effectively in their separate ways um, anyway let's get back to the football um, Rangers and Celtic having a wee tickle in the transfer market as we go into March um, Eric Bo Anderson's 13 goals um, for Alborg in the first 20 games of the, the Danish Superliga was enough to persuade Walter Smith to spend 1.2 million at the end of February um, this is in addition to an earlier signing in November of Derek McInnes from Morton and um, Teo Snelders would, would come from Aberdeen right at the end of March Um with Celtic in mind, it looked like they hadn't learned their lessons from Mo Johnson because they were parading um, the Portuguese striker um, Jorge Cadet at Parkhead under the assumption that, that no transfer fee would be required. Um, yes, it did. That meant a lot more negotiations as Fergus McCann was going to be kind of forced to fork out for that deal. Um, so it was a few more weeks before he was finally registered with the SFA. Uh, one day too late in order to be eligible for the Scottish Cup semi-final, which just so happened to be against Rangers. Um, Fergus McCann sent a letter to the SFA thanking them for their help and assistance in completing the signing before furiously venting, of course, in the Celtic view, uh, that it was Chairman Jim Farry who held up the deal by that crucial day. Um, regardless, he wouldn't make Hamden, but there was another league encounter to negotiate before that. Um, at Ibrox, the final um, league game 
of the season, or well, firm league game of the season. Um, maybe, yep, some some late drama as we've had before, but maybe less raucous than some of the others. Um, we had a minute silence in this one, but it was impeccably observed. Uh, Scotland's showpiece sporting event took place at the end of a week of national mourning. Rangers played Celtic in the shadow of a gunman. Um, Dunblane um, massacre took place on the Wednesday. Um, the start of this week, if you if you look at the coverage, building this up to be the, you know the the, the battle of all battles because Rangers could effectively end this and if Celtic win puts it right back in the balance. They they draw level. Um, Walter Smith was filling up his car at the start of the week. Um, the attendant said, "You're ready for Sunday?" Yes, Smith replied, "You'd better be." Um, this obsession with, of course. 9 and 10, um, just overwhelming everybody, uh, but by the end, the language is tempered dramatically, um, and there's a bit of perspective uh, on the, the, the game itself. Um, the game itself, John, Rangers 1, Celtic 1, um, as I said, it was all right, Rangers not anywhere near at full strength, um, you get Craig Moore at right back, we don't have anyone else right wing back, John Brown deputising for Goff, um, Gascoigne still running the show, he's blowing fake cigars in the face of Jackie McNamara, who gets sent off later in the game for two really needless bookings, um, an in-swinging free kick of, I don't know how he does it, because he's going to do corners like that in, in a game later on, there's such height and dip that it just takes everybody out apart from his target, the target's Alan McLaren in this case, just a wee nudge, um, just needed to just caress the ball with his head, this was right before half time, um, but three minutes remaining, Rangers have got their hand, I think, on a 46th league championship, uh, but then John Hughes escaped Alan McLaren for quite a simple header. Significant for me, John, is that Rangers you know, a draw suits us better than it suits Celtic, but we didn't just dig in and see out the last few minutes. Front foot again. Stuart McCall hits the bar um, from a Gascoigne corner. McCoy blazes one wide and high um, when it was a really good chance to finish it um, again from a Gascoigne pass. Um, but I suppose both sets of fans that day went home relatively happy. The, the title's still in the balance and that week more than any other was a reminder that life does go on. Yeah. I don't think leaving there that we actually thought as Rangers fans that the title was in the balance. Um, you know, we wanted to win. I think by now, given their propensity for dropping points when we drop points and their inability to take advantage of our shortcomings occasionally through through these things I, I think we know and I mean even this game I mean it, it's a typical kind of Burns is Celtic kind of frantic a little bit frenetic people build them up with a silky football or whatever but really if any team was going to deserve to win on whatever statistical facts it was us and and you'd be just you always feel you have it until you don't, which we'll come to in a season or two. But at this point, you always feel you've got it. You know, we have we have the quality. I mean, Gascoigne is having one of the great seasons. Uh, and it's not as if he's doing it on his own. You know, everybody else is pitching in. There's more consistencies we've talked about. And, I mean, the striking thing when I was looking back at this, and I didn't know it was this game, is when we're lined up to come out the tunnel in this game. Yeah. And McStay comes out in his own and he's looking very lost and sheepish. Yeah. And I think he's one of our guys is like McCoy. The rest are not coming. Yeah. And it just that epitomizes I think the two mindsets of the teams. We're confident, we're together, we're going for it, and they're kind of I don't think they actually believe that they should be there or at that level. And when you look at the two teams I mean, is there anywhere in the pitch where they have a player that you might say, well, we wish we had him in the team? Maybe Van Hoydonk at a push, but the rest of them? I don't think so. I mean, and it's quite, and it's quite typical for us this season, isn't it? We get in a good position and we think our job's done, switch off, 
mm. lose a stupid one and then move back through the gears again. I think they, going back through the gears again, Andy, I, I, I'd almost forgotten that because the, the, the Walter Smith kind of playbook again we're in the ascendancy they 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 need to win really um a draw is, is fine um but i think it's really sick i think it's telling that that we're like well that's annoying that's a real pain in the ass we've got three minutes plus injury time Let, let's go and try and grab this again i think that that shows confidence hubris maybe i mean we have spoke about this in previous episodes where we kind of felt so superior to them that we could have what we would consider a slip up. So this was a slip up by any standard. You know, we're one nothing up. We're doing ten men, aren't they? And uh, yeah. and, they, and and we don't win the game or don't see the game out. So we always felt as if we were always going to be at them over the course of a season. As it turns out, you know, I think you know one old firm title, uh, old, old old firm game either way kind of decided it ultimately but I don't know I just think we were too full of ourselves to be honest but there was some justification in it we just knew that we were going to have enough to get past them whether it was to step up a gear or whatever I don't know man. but I remember at the time thinking it was a kind of shrug of the shoulders opportunity to loss but yeah. another day and the chances are they'll cock up at some point as well so uh, that's my recollection of how, how we felt at the time yeah, a bit relaxed. Well, we were what three points and a superior goal difference, thirteen ahead. So effectively four points ahead, seven games to go. Maybe balanced with the fact that of the seven games we've got four away, um, and they don't. Um, it was assumed that there'd be a few more twists and turns, and that's how it proved almost immediately. Uh, Rangers were two up at home to Falkirk playing great stuff. Uh, another individual masterclass from Gascoigne and Loudrop, but then I think we came out in our slippers, caught cold. Um, ended up winning 3-2. Eric Bo Anderson scored his first goal for the club, um, just ensuring that, that cushion. Um, but it was nervy in the end, uh, unnecessarily so, but another Celtic stalemate at this time away at Motherwell gave Rangers a five-point lead that evening. Surely that was that. But um, the next weekend, it starts Park. Cody, um, seven minutes remaining. It's still technically all back in the balance. Rangers are 2-1 ahead. Uh, oh, sorry, Wraith Rovers are 2-1 ahead, and Rangers are floundering a bit. Um, a bit of a chaotic game, a couple of penalties involved, and then another high-looping um, spinning Gascoigne corner finds McCoy in the six yard box 2-2 two, two, the same combination strikes goal with a minute to go and Rangers win the game um, Andy there's so many moments of this season that's why these shows have been so long that are packed with interest and, and, and little turns here and there um, so it's I think it's understandable that some uh, underrated moments kind of slip through the gap of, of, of those the, that collective memory but this is an important Saturday afternoon um, and I think this one gets forgotten because Celtic go on, they, they play Aberdeen on the Monday night, they win 5-0 um, but in terms of you know momentum shifting one way or the other, um, we were really bad that day but we still come through I'd forgot completely about this um, and, and the McCoy's hat-trick I suppose it's only natural that when you look back on big title victories that you look at the, the big games but in amongst that as you say Martin there's these games that have very fine margins and it's when you overcome that day of poor form or circumstance or refereeing decisions or whatever it is that when you overcome them they can add up to the inches that take you to, towards the, the clinching um, I was at this game so this is why I'm surprised I forgot yeah. about it is this, is this the game? This must have been the game where you've got the famous McCoyst and Gaza kiss. No, that, funnily enough, someone it's asked. Not. Someone asked. Um, I think it was. Uh, I think Are it was you Callum. sure, Martin? I am absolutely sure. Someone asked That's us on the thread what? last week. I think it was Callum. It's it, on the in the season video. Is this is this where they have a kiss? And because we're wearing the Harlequin strip, we didn't use it very often. It didn't take place at Starts Park. It took place at Tanadice. It took place against Inverness, Caledonia and Thistle in the quarterfinal of the Scottish Cup. Another game against a Highland League club that was moved for safety and, and tickets <laughs> or whatever. Um, and we won 3-0. McCoy scored the second. Um, Gascoigne comes over and it's the 
most tender, lingering little kiss. But yeah, that's again in the Harlequin Red and White strip. It's, it's at Tanadice that day. I did watch it back just to be absolutely sure. Um, McCoy, you couldn't, you couldn't catch McCoy um, when he, he he scored that winner um, because he was all over to Archie Knox and Walter and, and the, the the bench and because it's proper dramatic stuff but yeah it's funny how the the, the, the memory conflicts just because of the the, mind. the strip it's just we don't you know why it's off. there though Martin if you watch the end of season video have they, cut they it? have it in the middle of it they, they have it in this race the Rovers game they have Gascoigne sitting on top of McCoy and giving him a kiss yeah they, they splice quite yeah, a bit they, in that know, they've obviously signed in a different one or whatever but that's why people think it, yeah. it comes up at the end of the season Video or it's quite know. annoying that it's quite annoying that end of season video because they they do a lot of those montages and still instead of just giving the games their place the way that they they, they used at the, the the start of 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 this run, um, so that it does it is quite annoying. But no, it, it's it's at Tanadice for the Cali game. Anyway, Celtic won five 0 It might be out fair to argue that if Rangers had slipped up, that Celtic wouldn't have played with that freedom and expression against Aberdeen, mind you, it's Aberdeen, um, and they would have, you know, slipped up themselves when when this opportunity to strike arose, um, because it's fair to say that, because that's exactly what happened next in the league. Rangers' next league game was in Gorgie, um, through to play Hearts, Rangers were garbage, it was a Wednesday night, um, and again, this Jim Jeffrey side, youthful, on the way up, um, Great value for their 2-0 win. Very comfortable. Celtic yet again failed to make it count. In fact, they needed a very late goal themselves from Pierre van Hooydonk to even get a point at home to Kilmarnock. Now, these two fixtures we talked about last week, Rangers being defeated 3-0 at home uh, by Hearts and Celtic drawing 0-0 at Rugby Park. You can kind of understand... Oh, a, a, a freak opportunity has arisen, um, but they're away from home. You know, away, away games are difficult. Still, I'm Scotland, um, certainly for Rangers. But in, in those days, you know, the trips were trips were tricky. There's no excuse at home. There is just no excuse for Celtic at all. Um, and it's a four point lead. It should have been two. Um, that one may say could have again fueled that that belief, um, but. It just fueled Rangers' belief further, um, with only one kind of awkward game left. Maybe the reason why there wasn't that carbon copy of, uh, or there was that that that, that carbon copy of what we see in the winter, um, was because Celtic were very dejected by the time that Kilmarnock game came. Rangers were very, let's say, flat by the time that Hearts game came, because in the weekend it was the Scottish Cup semi final. Loudrup spotted Robertson again. He tried to steer it, McCoy's must score! Rangers take the lead, the holders are behind. Jury, oh, Loudrup has sprung clear. Brian Loudrup past Marshall. And Rangers feel that they've got one foot in the final. Okay, um... The final iteration, the sixth game, and probably the worst, to be honest, in terms of the quality of football. Um, pundits everywhere were just assuming Celtic would would, would finally do this. Um, only a fool would ever predict the outcome of an own firm game, so I'm taking Celtic to win 1-0 at Hamden this afternoon. Wrote our good friend Jeremy McNee that morning. I don't think they'll need luck this afternoon because they're playing well enough to overcome their great rivals at last. Um, Gaza cut a brief pre-match chat with Radio Clyde short, uh, refused to talk to them until they got rid of McNee. And the following week's column was entitled Kiss Off Gaza, uh, as McNee counted the names of the big icons of Scottish football had taken issue with him, but they were no longer around. He said, whenever you're ready to go home, Paul, I'll be glad to oblige with a one-way ticket before going on to lend his support to Hearts in the final. And he wrote, as I write, Greg Norman is chasing the Masters title. His record there is as heartbreaking as the Jam Tarts and Scottish Majors. Norman and Hearts for a double lead me to a friendly bookmaker quickly. Well... Both would crumble in the end. Um, the semi, as I said, wasn't the best, Andy. Um, Celtic were very predictable in possession. I thought we were more intelligent. We were clamping their width. That was the secret to 
Celtic success, I say success very much in inverted commas, their improvement that season. Um, we did very well on that. Um, McCoy made amends um, because he, he really messed up a good opportunity after only 17 minutes. He didn't pass the second one by. Um, Rangers sitting in so deep in that second half, inviting the pressure. Uh, Martin Tyler was on Sky. Rangers haven't pushed out very far and they're inviting more pressure, but it's something I think we were increasingly comfortable with. Um, there's a throw in, Clellan throws the ball to Gascoigne, this is deep inside the Rangers half, and not for the first or last time, we'll see it in the cup final, it's an exhibition of what this Rangers side could do so lethally. Um, less than eight seconds it took from Gascoigne's chest, uh, one touch from him, one touch from Loudrop, one touch from Jury, um, a chest control as the Great Dane took possession back, and then that final touch just to lift the ball over Marshall, um, ended the, sh- the game as a contest, they'd get a, a late consolation, but um, what it did start was Sky's penchant f- at the time for showing Celtic fans, young and old, crying in the stands, and it was always great to see. Um, I think this this game, more than any other, has an impact going forward, because you, you just can't rely on the law of averages anymore, it's not about that. Um, Rangers just have something different. Not at their best, um, but they've just got two players on a totally different stratosphere. And when the rest of the team unit is solid and secure, they're not really going to do it. And I think it deflates Burns. Uh, This is his last chance, really, realistically, of success. Um, I think they expected, after they won the Scottish Cup the year before, that they would push on. And, you know, they didn't. He's kind of... He's kind of shell-shocked after it, speaking to Davy Provenance guy, I don't feel we deserve to lose that game. Uh, I don't, at the same time, I don't think we deserve to win it, but I definitely felt we deserve to take something from it. Uh, presumably he meant a replay rather than a point from a <laughs> cup tie. But there's just this kind of incoherence, he then goes on to suggest that Loudrop was offside for the second goal, he wasn't. Um, and assuring the media that Celtic would, would take the title to the last day. He's scrambling around that day, and I don't think he recovers from this one more than any of the other five that, that, that season. No, oh, this this really took the wind out of their sails because I, I remember the build up to this game and there's that wee inner voice that because you're right, man, all the noise was that Celtic were going to do something because so this was the sixth game, Six. sixth old firm yeah. game this season. Had so I uh, and and I remember thinking we'll be doing well to win this because you just don't win six old firm games in a row, it just doesn't happen. Um, so you, you, you kind of doubt it, but it goes back to what I was saying earlier on about whatever you want to call it, hubris, overconfidence, or just a tacit knowledge that you're, you're better than your opponent. That's what happened, because in the moments, Gascoigne and Loudrop made it, and um, they, they, they raise you above mediocrity. That second goal, I think it's a very underrated goal, because, as you say, it was two... One to three, one touches. Yeah. Foot no, inside your in half, and then the next thing you've got a guy breaking through, and the last guy, if you're the opponent, one breaking through, right Loudrop. No. And it's, it's a great, it's actually it's a great finish. Great finish. So, um, I, I, that, that, this really bursts their bubble, bubble because I think any, any lingering beliefs that they had in the stands or on the pitch were blown away that day because we weren't even playing that way well, and we still put them in the cup. Easter Sunday, John, it's quite nice from what I remember. I was there right behind the goal as well, uh, as Loudrop lobbed that ball over. Um, and I, I was doing work experience with the Rangers News the week after it, so it was a bit of a joy, um, just that, that whole thing. Not so much the Wednesday night against Hearts, right enough. Um, would you agree? I, I think this is underrated, this game. I think that goal's underrated. I think it's devastating, absolutely devastating. Um, but we're obviously going to go into 96-97, where the Old Firm League games are going to be so important and Rangers win them all. I think the route is there. I think this this I think this is a deadly blow to to the belief around Burns within that, that dressing room and within that support. Because Andy's right, I mean have you gone can you remember going six games or, or more without defeat? Yeah, I would say we probably did it from oh, S- September seventy four. And then we don't lose again until um, it would be November 76. So there is a purple patch with the first uh, Premier League where we go through 
oh, mm. this is when I started going to league games where it's six or seven, but it's highly unusual. And definitely highly unusual for us. I'm not sure. It might have been the other way when Greg yeah, was the manager. Sure. But, I mean, the other thing, I think they, they were tied into all these emotionally. That high top that there have been five games, sooner or later they're going to win. What that hides was the two Ibrooks games we should have won. Yeah. You know, with the goal chopped off and the three each. And then, you know, they get the late equaliser and then we go up. So the two Ibrooks games they actually got away with. And I think they also associated with Scottish Cup. They have a very good record against us. They do. Easter Sunday, boy, do they love this. Mm. You know, going back through the whatever history, well, not their history, you know, and tying it in. And we'd lost, I think, Easter Sunday is probably the last <laughs> soonest as old firm games, those mm-hmm. two. So the, there's all these emotions and, you know, the Scottish Cup, they still think it's the thing they cling to. And I loved this game. It was just so clinical. It just highlighted. It was almost like the way people would praise Liverpool the past two seasons about, you know, out of possession. The pre- I'm not saying we pressed. But when we got the ball, we did something with it. When they get the ball, they huffed and puffed. I mean, it really was running around and... I mean, the goal from Loudrop is majestic, but even the first goal, yeah. you know, Roberts the, getting played in, cutting in, curling it, McCoy's just coming in. I think we always had it. And I was not I wouldn't say I was super confident before the game because it, it is 50-50. You know, you don't know whether that refereeing decision or whatever. But as soon as McCoy puts his arm and then we go into the second, you just think... Nah, they, they're not doing it. Of course, we switch off. We let them back into it so they can cling to something late on if only. But I mean, this is just the culmination of Burns letting his emotions take over him hmm. and also communicating to the team. The same for the January, your own break will break my heart or whatever. What is that saying to your team? I mean, as a manager, you have to... Saying it's over. No matter what you're feeling, you have to put a different slan, either complain about the referees or say... We're not far away. Yeah, Yeah. whatever. And this is just... I mean, 2-1, I would say, flatter them. I think if we needed to win by three or four, win by three or four that day, we probably could have. But we just... We got the second goal and then... We were back to blowing cigars again, and we let one in. But I mean, you look at the two teams. I mean, this particularly, they seem to have a team full of fullbacks who aren't really fullbacks. You know, my mm-hmm. Mara and Grant, I'm assuming, play somewhere in the midfield. And you're just looking at this, their team, and thinking there's no quality, there's no real shape. You know, you've got Midget McLaughlin and is it Donnelly on the other side? Mm-hmm. I'm just thinking, you, you just look at it, if you look at it in cold, hard facts, which you can't do in old firm, particularly in a build-up, but looking back at it, you just think, was it ever really going to be any result? They got away with, as I say, the two Ibrox games. They got away with two draws when it should be some chances, everything else. We should have won both of those. And it should have been... You know, they should have been looking down the barrel of the fifth fifth defeat in six games. Yeah. But I mean six games in the season they can't win. It just it just breaks them and it, but Burns is thankfully he's not the right guy for that kind of thing because you have to be almost like Walter, you know, when the bad times come, slowly faced. You don't get sure weaknesses that the other people can the other side can see, well, look what happens when you do this. Yeah, because it just feeds into that uh, fatalism, um, uh, uh, I suppose. It, I think it was th- that Celtic team is just just too many, too many attacking players, too many ball players on on the field, and it, it it just wasn't pragmatic. But you know, we've talked about that before. Andy, we quite word for super. Um, the real renaissance season with genuine concerns that you know the the summer before that. You know, he's never really going to get back. 23 goals in all competitions by the end. Um, and he's popping up when it absolutely matters. And when that, when Marshall doesn't deal with that ball, and it's not right to his feet, you know, there's still a wee bit of work to do, but 
you don't care. It's you're celebrating that before he's even touched it. it proved a lot of people wrong, McCoy, this season because um, you're still in a transfer uh, heady, if you might call it yeah. that, where we're linked to the very best strikers that are around Europe and beyond, and it just keeps going. And I mean, the goals are crucial. I mean, we spoke about the hat trick at starts part, but he just keeps popping up with key goals, and it is he's just irrepressible. And um, I think it's testament to him because when you look back at it now, for him, the easy, easy thing would have been for him to check out and do what he did at Kamara earlier. Mm. I know he did nothing left to prove at Rangers, but he kept on going and and a team that could have been reshaped every year or, or you know, the, or the key positions could have been reshaped every year. He kept giving the manager and the fans for that matter food for thought. You just can't argue with his goals and, and the key the, when he scores yeah. them, these aren't the third yeah. goal and a three nothing victory. These are big, big goals. This is and that's just been his stock and trade. And you can go back to that 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 only goal at, at Parkhead's um the first all front game of the season in the, the, the League Cup. Um, just just popping yeah. up absolutely when it matters. Um, fair to say, I think the boys had a few um, sherbets after um, that win and you know they, they faltered at, at Tynecastle. Um, a big response at Ibrox the, the following weekend, a 5 0 win over Thistle. Bo Anderson scored a hat trick, um, but it's Loudrop that was actually. Um, grabbing the headlines he didn't score but he's, he's just involved in everything he played a wee bit more central a wee bit closer to Gascoigne again we're getting glimpses into something that, that that's going to happen uh, in the season finale I suppose the only test potential moment uh, was on the 20th of April when Rangers travelled to Fur Park a place where they've already dropped points this season and in four of the previous six seasons you know no one has to remem- uh, remind us about 1991 of course um, Celtic won comfortably uh, home to Falkirk, I guess, in the hope that, that, that history repeated itself. But Rangers took five minutes um, to go ahead against um, Motherwell, Stuart McCall, um, standing in for Richard Goff still as, as skipper. Um, great drive, um, or he had been standing in, sorry. Um, Bo Anderson gets one um, before half time to make it comfortable and then Gascoigne and Loudrop um who else combine to put it to bed? Um, another huge hurdle cleared, and unless their great rivals slipped up again on the Saturday, which they didn't, Rangers now just needed one win from the final two league matches to win the title. And so, to Ibrook Stadium, Sunday the 28th of April, for arguably the greatest match win and individual performance that the old place has ever seen. 19 and a half minutes gone now. Still no scoring here at Ibrook Stadium. Perhaps a chance for the Dons. And it's Goff who's here in the serving. And Aberdeen sensationally take the lead. Well, Goff will be unhappy that he failed to get that cross away. Here's Gascoigne now. Can he produce some magic? Still it's Gascoigne. Oh, yeah! Balance. Here's Gascoigne now, pushing forward, showing great determination. Oh, he's done it again! It's unbelievable! And Ibrook scores absolutely wild. Well, I did say he was perhaps keeping something for the closing stages. He had gone a bit quiet, but he was obviously keeping something for a long busting run. He goes right through the defence. Well, Gordon Jury missed from the penalty spot last week as Gascoigne is going to take this one and Gascoigne has already scored from the penalty spot This is for the hat-trick of the championship <laughs> 86 minutes gone and Rangers have won the championship 
Okay, I know you're going to say it was never in doubt, blah, blah, blah. But Aberdeen have caused us problems in Glasgow. That league game was horrific. They knocked us out of the cup at Parkhead. And I guess Celtic fans, neutrals, Tommy Burns on his little um, social jaunt to Loch Lomond that afternoon would have had their interest peaked uh, when Brian Irvin put them ahead. Um, and who knows if the minutes had passed and passed and passed before the equaliser and the tension really built up, uh, it might have been intolerable, Rangers might have stuttered but perhaps he would have just done something special anyway because this was his season um, in the end it only took Gascoigne two minutes to get to get Rangers level um, an incredible goal um, touch and awareness and strength I make that the eighth time that Gascoigne had scored a solo goal that we would remember forever if he hadn't just kept matching it and bettering it the next time and in this game obviously it came um, it came later on in the second half um, and was voted of course on this network as the greatest ever Rangers goal of all time um, back in 2018 I mean there's, there's nothing left to say about it really it, it, it just made a team sport completely redundant for a few seconds those who got near him were just shoved off those who didn't, I think, were too fearful to, to, to even try. It was just a gas going goal. Um, but it was such a goal when it was needed. Ten minutes left to, to go and win the, the, the league title. He wanted off. He was pleading to come off because he was just shattered. And then he got this second wind. Um, I don't think there's been a more fitting way to, to win the championship. It was, of course, sealed with that third, that penalty. Um, and there's McNee on commentary. And he messes up. I don't think he realises what he's, he's, the overall significance. He tries to get the words in. This is for the hat-trick in the championship. Out before the ball actually hits the net. Um, and this guy who's who's leading the media's, the nation's score, and he has led it from day one, um, was in place to, to, to narrate this conclusion to, to one of the most impressive individual seasons in, in the Scottish game. Um, he's calling the next week. Gaz and I spoke our first words amicably to one another on the Sunday after the title decider so now I'm lifting my ban on him that was it 25 words and one sentence at the very end of his first column after one of the most remarkable performances in the history of the Scottish game and even then enough room for some self um, aggrandizement um, I mean this relationship is going to sour even further um, and make me in his column and it's not this season it's the following season that he starts to refer to him starts to refuse to refer to him as Gascoigne and just as the more kind of dehumanising number eight. Um, maybe poignant then at that moment where McNeese commentating on this this hat trick that Gascoigne pulls the jersey over his head. He can't be seen other um, than that, that, that number eight. Now, the title of this chapter, the title of this, this group of pods is called number eight. It's obviously a play on the, the, the title win. Um, and... I wanted to talk about McNee and, and this this antagonism towards Gascoigne. Someone um, sent me a message and loved the show, but do you think that's that's right that we you know you use that um, that heading because it's understandable it left a kind of bitter taste for Rangers fans to 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 see. I wonder if it's time to reclaim it. Um, we've had greats play for this club. Um, we talk about the greatest elevens, but I think there's only one definitive Rangers number eight. Um, 19 goals, nearly as many bookings right enough, you'd have to go back to Alan McCoist for a first season at Rangers with more, and then you add in the assists and the assists and the assists and the big moment um, and I think the life he gave back to this flagging and complacent Rangers dressing room, Loudrop didn't do that Gascoigne did um, I'll say it, I don't think there's ever been a Rangers player with a season like this Discuss Andy first. Certainly not a debut season, put it that way. Nah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the impact was. I mean, the impact was huge before he'd even signed for us. If you remember how how we we, we had a a wee burst at the end of the, the season before, and there's c- cardboard cutout guys in the ground before we even signed them. Walter Smith talks about character a lot, and he, I remember him referring to like Sam Russo and the fact that. You know, it's not just about football and ability, it's about character and, and you have to be able to bring that to play for Rangers and I think amongst the goals and assists and the magical, magical moments it gives us, 
there was the character as well because for all oh, he's a, a joke and a clown um there is moments in this season where he digs very deep along with his teammates and he's not found one and I think that sometimes he's washed away amongst all the, the kind of things that we remember he, he had a wee bit of steeliness about him at times this was probably his best footballing season domestically anyway and um I think he should get credit for that because the McNee thing, McNee was clever. I think, I think he was more clever than I'll probably give him credit for. I think he knew that this was box office to do what he was doing in his, in his column. And, of course, this is when a column in a Sunday newspaper actually made something. Mm. You know, it, was, it, was, um, it was big news, literally. He also had, I can't remember the name of the show, Martin, but I, I, there was a midweek show late at night about, was it Sport and Question? Sport and Question. I think yeah. I'm... Sport question, it cheered by to be fair. Mm. McNee was, was actually dynamite on that and, and had a grudging respect for him. But it, it kind of sometimes tipped over into Venom when it came to, to Gascoigne and it made it more sweet when he did things like this because you could not question the absolute genius that was on display that day. Um, I mean, that's a, that, that goal, um, so that would be the equaliser, yeah, the first goal. That's one of my favourite of our Rangers yeah. goals because... It's just magical the way he beats the man, the wee chop, and goes into a territory that just looks impossible and then scoops it into the net and the goalkeeper's just standing there. It's incredible. And even watching that, um, the, the highlights back in preparation for this, the way he moves with the ball and the way he just glides without apparent pace, it's just poetic. And it, and it's something I'll never forget as a Rangers fan. Watching Gascoigne was one of the highlights. I've probably the highlight. Um, him and Loudrop, I've got to say, probably the highlight of my uh, Rangers support because I don't think I'll ever see two players better, never mind yeah. the same team. And that day just a part of Come back to that wee point in a minute. John, you've seen some some greats. Um, this this show, that, that day, again, it's come with the man in it. Cometh ever, cometh the man. Um, it's, it's not just doing it in a 5 0 drubbing of Motherwell. Um, these are the moments, this is the stage. And again, for a season, especially a debut season, I, I don't think there's a stronger one. The numbers, the importance, given what you had to come back from, because it was a time where, where fans were, were losing patience as much as um, a lot of the, the, the kind of fourth estate was. Um, I don't think it's been surpassed. No, I don't think it's been surpassed. That I mean, trying to go back through, as you said, McCoy to the great, that initial season, but we weren't great, although he did score. The only one, and it's more about impact, you might throw into the mix would be Butcher eighty six, eighty seven, hmm. uh, and that's it. That's more impact. The stats won't back it up, but the, you they know, never the do for defenders, do they? The belief, yeah. I mean, it, it, but that's in a different context. Uh, this is, it's also helped by the season we have. I mean, let's be honest. We do the double and we're in the midst of talking about three games in six weeks in mm. terms of the Cup semi, the final and this game, which are just three of the best games that you could ever wish to see. And we have, you know, all of them at once, Gascoigne's playing. And I think it's, even at the seasons after this, I think we're getting talked a lot about, this. maybe the last time we were really, really being talked a lot about in England because of Euro 96 coming yeah. up, because of Gascoigne. It's Sky that does the Cup semi, you know, and it's the, I think Richard Keyes is there. Charlie Nicholas is looking, I don't know, um, quite the character, but... I think all of that throws in the mix and that you can't take it away from his stats and everything else. But the whole theatre of that season, or particularly the post Christmas period, suddenly put everything on because it just brings everything alive and his goals and I mean I I went to that game against Aberdeen. It was confident we were going to win the league, but it wouldn't yeah, surprise me if we dropped points mm, against Aberdeen mm. and had to win it the following week. I mean it, but at that point, even if we'd lost the last two games, I wasn't convinced that Celtic would have won the, the, their last game to to overtake us. But to do it in such a manner, as you say, with the goals, and it just, 
it was memorable. It was, it seemed, a lot of sunny days in Scotland that, yeah, that spring, yeah, is yeah, there not? Yeah, <laughs> there really, really, really is. Um, I, I, I take the, the, the Butcher point. I I don't think you can extricate Butcher from Woods and Graham Souness um, from from impact and confidence and, and, and whatever else. Um, and I've already mentioned, I think Gordon Petridge is a very underrated signing this season just in terms of what he can give to Smith's unit. Um but you know, go and go and listen to the shows four weeks ago. Um, even with Loudrop giving us some aesthetic joy, it's still a pretty poor, disjointed uh, Rangers team, and he just turns on all the lights. I've never seen anything like it um, before. I've never seen anything like it since. Interestingly, only seventy-two percent of Rangers fans agreed with the Scottish writers and the Scottish professional footballers in terms of um, their player of the year in fall of fall, uh, Andy Gorham to 11% um, and best midfielders um, Stuart McCall with 18% of the vote um, Brian Lowdrop had won 100% the previous season but I think this w- it tells you more about the Rangers team at that point, this is a good team season, there are there are performances, there are people coming back McCall and Ferguson being, being two McCoy's being another, Goff, Gorham right back into form um, concerns with with some, if not all, of those that we'd maybe seen the the last of those heroes, and you know Rangers fans love that that group, especially um, group of Scots and and, and and Rangers fans. Even John Brown coming through with a, a real kind of career encore um, at, at the very end. Um, so there's so many David Robertson as well. So many parts to this season that are just um, just coming into play, and I think comes to fruition the the, the the couple of weeks later or three weeks later for the, the Scottish Cup final. Um, disappointment for one of those players, Ali McCoist, um, ruled out um, right at the, the, the death of um, selection for that um, Scottish Cup final. And McCoist cut a very disconsolate figure, weirdly, when the, the title winning um, lap of honour. Um, a lot of chat, is he going to sign this new con- uh, contract or not? Um, you know, what I say, twenty goals, another league medal. Is this the the, the the time to kind of bow out Rangers? You get the, the shadow of Jardel, but not only that, you get Jean Luca Vialli, with whom David Murray and, and Walter Smith had met in Turin, um, middle of April. Um, he did obviously go to Chelsea, and then you get Carl uh, Heinz Riedler, Mikael Beck, Oliver Bierhoff. Um, you've got some of the best strikers in Europe being talked to, being chased um, and therefore what, what's going to happen to Ali. He does sign a new deal as does someone else, um, Brian Loudrop, for whom the final is most remembered. Jury to Loudrop. That's good running by Loudrop, a chance here for Rangers. That's the other. Hearts were ripped asunder. And Loudrop's finish was deadly. Jury's pass off with Loudrop and on again, followed by McManus. Severe test for young McManus this, looking after Loudrop. And a bloomer by Rousset. Who would believe it? Jury's pass, here's Loudrop. McManus goes back with him. Played it early this time, but Jury! Okay, Oaks, like Gascoigne's domination of the season, um, I feel it a wee bit unfair that Loudrop kind of owns this match um, because it's a truly, truly superb Rangers performance. I would say it's the pinnacle of Walter Smith's time in charge in terms of sheer quality, balance, expression. Um, I think for Smith and Soonis, Cup Finals had been about 
one thing only, and that's that's results. Um, we'd either won by one goal, we'd lost by one goal, or that eighty-seven League Cup final, we, we'd also drew and and won in penalties. Smith's finals were garbage, save for the McCoist overhead kick. That that Hibs game was all right, but the two ones and obviously that one 0 defeat against Dundee United, they were poor spectacles. He didn't care; he was there just to to, to pick up medals. And maybe because hearts are confident, there's a natural youthful exuberance, and then Gary Locke gets injured early on, and they haven't really prepared for that. Um, maybe that makes it a more open game anyway. But Rangers are just fun. And the movement of Jury and Loudrop, not playing with a striker, hearts don't know where to go, they're coming deep in that, that, that first Loudrop goal, a perfect example of that. They don't know how to pick up, they don't know how to do it. Obviously, the Rousset mistake opens the floodgates, and then, you know, um, Jury has that, that, that hat trick. Um, but it's a genuine team performance. Gascoigne ran the game in a deeper role than normal, but more of a quarterback. Ferguson and McCall are, are superb in support. Um, Cleland, and especially Robertson, getting forward. And even John Brown, um, who drills a shot wide. If you watch it again, the pass and move for that, that would have been one of the greatest goals um, in, in Rangers history if he'd, if he'd finished that. It was just... It didn't flatter us, that 5-1 at all. Um, but I, I think it was just a, an absolute Saturday afternoon where we, we reveled, Andy. It was just fun. It was absolute fun. It was a carnival. Uh, uh, that's my recollection. So I was in the, the main stand, the kind of seated enclosure in the front with my dad. And the guys beside us had hip flasks and it was Gleva. I'd never tasted Gleva in my, my life. So every time I hear Gleva, I think of this final. And every time I see this final, I think of Gleva. And it was, I don't know if it was because we'd harmed the, the, you know, the weeks before and the way we'd won the league. And you're just in this eternal. Um, optimism of nine in a row, ten in a row and you're watching Gasco in a loud drop but I remember that game was just I mean you, you described it as fun I've never thought a football game with so much history it's fun but you're no, right no. that's what it was because I think there was an expectation that we were A, we were going to win the game but the way the game was going you know, Locke got injured it's clear to see loud drop was in the mood, it was a case of actually we're going to be entertained today and we were just the, the, the team were just humming. They were just going well, and you could see the for the first minute something was going to happen here. <clears throat> it's a brilliant day. I remember it vividly. And loud drop. I mean, are you saying we should have called a loud drop final because? I don't know why you're saying it because of anything. No, I don't think it's just because. It, no, I get it. Right, he was he was sublime. And Rangers, the previous, the, the Aberdeen game, uh, we were nervy and we weren't that brilliant. Um, and Gascoigne is show, like head and shoulders above anyone else in the pitch that day. I think Loudrop's sublime, but I don't think he's, I don't think the difference is, is, is that great. I mean, you get someone scoring a hat trick, I mean, Jury had missed about three chances before then, right enough. I just think it's a wee bit unfair on the, 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 the performance because when we call it that, it's as if it's this, this complete, virtuoso and the rest of the, the team have been pretty flat or whatever from 1 to 11 Rangers are superb that day and I, I don't I think, I don't think the team gets the credit it deserves for that performance No, I, th- I think you're right but, but see when you watch a football player and, you, and you're like he's in the zone you know, mm. you, you know mm. when you see a football player who is at the absolute top of his game and feeling it you know they're just so so much confidence flooding through them and, and that was louder that day and when he was in that kind of mood there was nothing better to watch on a football park than, than him and the flicks and the tricks and the, the speed. And oh, it was just, you know, yeah, I, I can't even get any better. I think that's why it was, because it was undeniable when you were watching it that he was, he was superb. And really, there'd be a point to prove because of what happened with Gascoigne, but it was. Um, I mean, <laughs> Jury, I mean, Jury's goal was a brilliant goal. I know. It's a fantastic goal. It's a brilliant goal. And Loudrop is and, just uh, toy, he's toying with the hearts of knackered. Paul uh, Ritchie just, he looks like, can you please just give us a break? Because um, Loudrop is just, he's actually quite sadistic at him. Yeah. Uh, no, all the lights were on, John, for us. Um, you wouldn't have known that, judging by Walter's face at the end, as he watched his team go up to, to collect um, the Scottish Cup. Um, his 13th trophy, his third double, I would say the finest 90 minutes of a Walter Smith team ever, 
Um, but he looks stone-faced um, because he knows and Hazel Irvin knows when she grabs him afterwards and does the usual platitudes, oh, you must be very pleased, blah, blah, blah. Right, what's next? It's all about next season. Who's coming? And he can't... It's almost as if, as if he can't enjoy it. He's talked in the in the run-up to that, that league, the Old Firm League game, the last one, that we meeting people at a supporters' function saying, I can't wait to celebrate 10 in a row. And he says, they've just assumed, you know, the rest. That this pressure is absolutely intolerable. Um, and he might have been the only Rangers fan in the stadium that, that, that wasn't enjoying it. We all were. I'm not sure that we were we were aware that this was aesthetically perhaps as 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 high as this era got. Certainly in terms of the two virtuosos, because we're talking about Viali that day in the stands. We're talking about who's next. We're expecting another summer of the kind of um, excitement and sensation that we had in 1995. And maybe we didn't appreciate it at the time, because this, certainly for Walter Smith, is, 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 I think, as good as it got. And we will not see two players like this ever again. Yeah, I can see where you're coming from uh, in terms of good as it got. I think maybe there's a slight generational. I think... When you watch some of the teams <laughs> that I did in the early eighties or whatever, and then even some of the guys in the sixties, you know if you've been watching Rangers for twenty, thirty, forty years, that you don't get two players of that quality on the pitch very often, if at all. Mm. I mean, we're talking once in a generation is definitely um what would you say? the maximum you're going to get. And, and it's really whether those two can continue in the following season, but the level Gascoigne was at. And also, I mean, you talked to it right at the very beginning that struck me about, you know, we got we as a support got Gascoigne. And then just now you were going on just about how, shall we say, the revitalisation, the energy for some of McCoy's, Brown, you know, these guys almost having the renaissance. I think it wasn't just the fans on the terraces, but I think some of the guys in the pitch responded in a similar manner. Yeah. And it brought out the best in them. You know, you're talking about Gorham, McCoy, so we're in a bit of doldrums and things, you know, injuries, whatever, and suddenly the, this guy creating mayhem, but obviously in a way that they like. And that takes on and also, Smith is doing what you would expect Bums to do. You know, you meet triumph and disaster the same way or whatever mm. uh, Mike Bassett said. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it is that stony face of, OK, I know we're brilliant. I want to go back inside, but let's not give anybody any, you know, watching this. Right, we're going to take that Smith thing. I think there is pressure, but he's known this pressure for two or three years. He gets really pissed <laughs> off. He gets pissed off at Hazel Irvin. He, he, he breaks uh, that. It's like, yeah. come on, uh, let me just enjoy this. And that's the thing. And we're going to talk about it a lot in the, the, the next set of episodes. How little, other than final whistles, we actually enjoyed that season because the pressure cooker was just too... Because all of this, if there's a slip up next season, doesn't matter. And that's how ridiculous Scottish football is. It's ridiculous how Rangers allowed, or what could we have done differently is maybe something we can get into. But um, we could enjoy it maybe that afternoon. But we are thinking ahead. Because you're caught up in something. Since five in a row, we're caught up in something bigger. And it's, it is a shame that you just can't... The players are. I mean, Gascoigne and Loudrop have a, an embrace, which I think is just beautiful, and the fans are. But, you know... Get the Euros on for a bit, and then it's 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 the season, the destiny, and Smith does bristle at, at Hazel quite a wee bit. And I think that's a good point, John. About I am speaking, probably projecting from from my position in the North Stand that day. Um, this is incredible, but can't wait to see Viali here and 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 whoever else um, because you know 
we are we're moving now. We're reinvigorated and and you know, Europe, uh tough draw. We'll know you know, chances are we'll get an easier one next year and, and kinda of, you know, move on. Sometimes you just need to stop. <laughs> and that's the, the, the naivety of youth, I guess, and just enjoy the moment because I'm not sure there have been um, many better than, than that, that that afternoon. Anyway, that's a double boys. Thank you, John. No, uh, thank you. No, that was perfect. Uh, it is one of those, and there's very few, to end the seasons that you that are just perfect uh, in all ways. Probably half 76 is maybe the only other one where everything falls into place and you can enjoy a cup final. So, no, thanks for, thanks for having me and Andy on for part four of this one. Yeah, pleasure. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Martin. I'm away to dream of loud up gas going gliding around the park and toying with defenders and passing boys into the There were good times. I mean, you know, more of these players surely would follow. If it wasn't Viali, it would be someone else. Somehow... The Rangers support at Hamden that day and all through the season couldn't fully appreciate what they were watching. They were taking it for granted. The mojo had returned and the push was on for the next stage of the development. Now that the laws had relaxed, the sky was seemingly the limit. Little did many realise that there was a new glass ceiling in place, not one dictated by unlawful directives, but by the power of market forces, television draw and an unrelenting pace of professionalism elsewhere. How many really cared about Europe in any case? How much was all talk from the chairman to the stands? A tabloid poll of the time asked Rangers fans if they would rather set a new domestic sequence or win the Champions League, the peak of footballing achievement in the next two years. The result was conclusive and shouldn't have come as a surprise to anyone listening to the new favourite song in honour of their new favourite player. Gaza wasn't here to make Rangers champions of Europe. Gaza was here for ten in a row. Until next time, bye for now. Oh,